Hello, you're watching Mapping Fault Lines and today we're going back to the Ukraine war where a lot of developments have been taking place in the past few weeks, even in the past few days. For one, we have a referendum which is taking place in certain territories. Russia has called for a certain kind of mobilization. We'll be talking about all this as well as some updates from the battlefield and responses from Western countries in this episode. We have with us Prabir Prakashtha. Prabir, so like I said, a lot of developments. But first of all, let's go to the referendum or referendum that's taking place in various regions uh, in Ukraine. So uh, first of all, we do know that uh, it's happening from September 23rd to 27th in four regions, the Donbas provinces as well as Zaporizhzhia and Kherson. So could you maybe quickly take us through what uh, Russia maybe seeks to achieve with this referendum and what's really at stake? Well, very simply put, uh, Russia is now arguing that if the people want to join the Russian Union, they will allow that to happen, provided more than 50% people participating in the referendum, or 50% of the population voting say yes. So essentially, the number of votes are going to count, and it seems in the first three days of the referendum, Da or referendums taking place in the four uh, oblast provinces that we already have more than 50 percent. In fact, in Lugansk and Donetsk, already more than 70 percent votes seem to have been cast, and the other two also more than 50 percent votes seem to have been cast. So, if we take that into account, the majority of the people are electing to be a part of Russia. That seems to be the uh, way the, at least the votes are tending to go. Now, we can talk about the le legitimacy of this referendums or referenda uh, later, but this is the situation, the voting situation on the ground. Crimea had already held a referendum much, uh, referendum much earlier and they had opted to join Russia. So that has been the situation on the ground. Of course, there are a lot of other uh, players, of course, Ukraine, being the key, who say we don't recognize this, this is, this is illegal and so on. But the question is really, what do the people want? What does the Russian, uh, the, as, a, as a country, what is the step they're going to do, uh, they're going to take? It's also interesting to note that though this is probably the sentiment in Donbass, Donetsk, and uh, as well as in Lugansk, uh, from 2014 onwards, right. at that time, Russia did not accept that these two provinces should become a part of Russia. They had in fact had suggested the Minsk Accords, which were reached, that this should actually have uh, autonomy within Ukraine. The problem of that has been that, of course, Ukraine never accepted that. The, the Poroshenko later on said that this was only a tactic for us to prepare militarily with NATO support to enter and take over these two provinces. So they, that seems, and that's Poroshenko's position. Right. Uh, that's public, uh, uh, as, as we know. Uh, the other part of it is that if you take the Russian perspective, they didn't want a Ukraine which would be so pro-NATO. So for them, the Russian minority in Ukraine who dis does not want war with Russia, does not want to join NATO, is therefore something which is a counterbalance to Western Ukraine, which is far more pro-NATO. So for them, this is not a political victory in the sense this allows Ukraine, if these four provinces join Russia, this allows Ukraine to go far more towards NATO and European Union at a time when the war will end and some, at some point the war has to end. So in that sense, it is minimizing Russia's losses, if mm -hmm. you will, that they don't see an alternative, particularly because Russian has now been virtually banned as a language within Ukraine. It can't be used in shops, offices, and so on. It can't be taught in schools. Russian language television stations have been stopped. Russian language uh, newspapers have been stopped. So given all of that, the identity of Russian language and Russian ethnicity itself is under attack in Ukraine. And given that, I, I think that Russia feels that it has really no alternative right. but to take this position. So this is basically what you're saying is in some senses an end to the idea of a multi-ethnic Ukraine which could have you know, where various perspectives could have, you know, viewpoints could have been balanced and 
So in some senses, but does it also mean, for instance, that this is pretty much closing the door on any kind of negotiated settlement also because uh, this is something, for instance, the Ukrainians have taken a huge amount of umbrage to naturally. No, well, you know, the, no country is going to accept that uh, part of it will go and join another country. But the point is this process has happened, for instance, in Czechoslovakia, where the two parts decided mutually to separate. It has also taken, there are multi-ethnic, multilinguistic communities, countries in Europe, which actually gives them a certain degree of uh, identity. They can keep their linguistic and ethnic identities. For instance, even in Italy, there are parts of it. Switzerland is another multi-ethnic country where multiple languages Belgium exist. Belgium for that matter. Pardon? Belgium for that matter. Belgium has, again, a large uh, population which speaks different languages, identify themselves as different ethnicities as well. So all of these compromises do exist. Nation states have come about to have been able to overcome it. But this is the 2014 is really the, uh, wa the watershed moment in which the uh, uh, so-called Maidan revolution takes place. And the United States called the shots, even against European Union. So given that, it was that is the watershed moment where Poroshenko comes into power, Yanukovych is forced to flee. And this is a coup. This is the, really the Maidan coup. There is no legal institution which sanctifies this change. Right. And then, of course, the crackdown on the, uh, those who are supposed to be identifying more with the Russians. And that leads in Donbass to the uh, revolt that we saw. And finally, the military engagement being ended. In fact, with uh, Russian intervention politically, as well as German and France being the intermediaries who say yes, the Minsk Accord, there are two of them, Minsk I, Minsk II, both of them promised autonomy for the Donbass region, which never was forthcoming. So given that, it is also very strange that Europe, European Union, which says that we accept all of these things, ethnic identities, linguistic identities to be protected, haven't actually uh, supported any of that in Ukraine. And of course, there is a degree of uh, hypocrisy in this, because even when it comes to the Roma, for instance, and there's a huge numbers of Roma in Europe, their identities have never been really protected either. So this has been more politically, how can you win in the identities recognition? And ultimately, if the other side doesn't want, then it ends up by being a war, which right. unfortunately is where we, are, we have been headed in uh, Ukraine. Except, of course, you have Russia as the protector of the Russian ethnicity and linguistic ethnicity. If you look at the map of Ukraine, for instance, and if you take the elections which Yanukovych won, you will see, uh, of course, he won all in the West Ukraine also, but if you take a previous election, you will see that Russian ethnic or Russian linguistic speakers have voted differently in Eastern and Southern Ukraine than from Western Ukraine. Right. So this revision really runs very deep uh, politically as well. So in that sense, is it better to part or stay? If you take the Russian view, they really wanted the Russian speakers and linguistic identities to be in Ukraine, to be a counterbalance. It's the failure of that which has led finally to this what is this right. referendum. Absolutely. But Peter, also speaking of the war, we also see that Russia has recently announced a mobilization. This comes after reports of, uh, according to the West, at least major setbacks faced by Russian forces in Ukraine. By the way, they were talking about it. It seemed like it was a matter of weeks before the Russians crumbled. That hasn't happened. But uh, at the same time, this mobilization does mark a fresh stage in some senses. So do we see this as Russia... Uh, you know, moving into a stage where, where, where it is terming this a full-fledged war, willing to commit more troops, does that look like it's going to happen? Well, again, the crystal ball isn't working. So I'm not, I'm not going to be able to predict, particularly as whenever we do such predictions, <laughs> we tend to misread the situation. Right. So if we look at it another way, let's look first at what is the amount of loss that Russia has, seemed, uh, has suffered. And if you look at the map again, you will see it's barely 1% of the territory they had taken over. Since February. Since February. So in that sense, it is militarily, if we want to talk about it, it's a very insignificant amount of land. The argument is Russia has been 
going forward at a very small, at a very slow, slow pace, kilometers, two kilometers, three kilometers a day. And here, if you see suddenly they have withdrawn really 50, 100 kilometers and therefore this amount of land falling to Ukraine in a very few, uh, in a very few days. The flip side of that, of course, is that, that also the reports, again, even by the Western media organizations, is that intelligence reports from satellites and other sources indicated that Russia was holding this area uh, very, with very thin presence of troops. Therefore, it was ripe for a counterattack, and that's why when they attacked, the Russian troops withdrew. Uh, the other side of uh, other picture is that there are also a lot of losses Ukrainian troops took because they're advancing in relatively open territory which the Russians right. then could attack. I'm not getting into that because those are, again, military discussions we have not been having here because we are not military experts. If we look at the larger picture, what you will see is that the Kharkov area, the Kharkov Oblast has been not a very active sphere uh, of activities for Russian military forces. They have concentrated on the Donbass and in southern uh, Ukraine. That's been the more the focus that they have had. And it does seem after initially attacking Kharkov, they really decided it wasn't worth taking. It's a very largely uh, Russian speakers, but it is also very, uh, it's, a, it's a really an urban area, which means the losses in order to take it will be very high. And there's a second largest city in Ukraine. So they don't seem to have that much of stake in Kharkov uh, as others might think they have. And therefore, they're willing to let that go if these four oblasts or these four provinces plus Crimea it, uh, joins Russia. What is going to happen in the war is very uncertain at the moment. Because if you look at the larger picture again, of the NATO support to Ukraine, that seems to now be in some kind of a, uh, shall we say, in some kind of a, my, I will say, emerging crisis. Because can the West continue, can the NATO continue to pump in that amount of arms and with financial support to Ukraine? The reports, and we have been talking about these uh, reports from, uh, say, a month or two. Now, these reports indicate that the amount of stocks that the Western countries have, the NATO forces have, is dwindling. And their ability to replace it, in fact, even restock for themselves, right. is not that great. So given that, how, mu how much can they continue to bleed their military uh, stocks for helping Ukraine is an open question. If you remember, there was uh, RUSI, which is actually the services institutes of the Royal Services of the United Kingdom. They had, they, somebody had written a long article giving the statistics, which are also what economists had roughly also said, that the stock of military supplies with the NATO countries itself is uh, not sufficient, nor their ability to produce that many number of uh, weapons as Ukraine, the land war in Ukraine seems to would uh, demand. And that's partly because the NATO has been fighting in Afghanistan, Iraq, uh, Libya, and they are not geared up for industrial scale war. Russia, in turn, from 2014, seems to have been preparing for such a possible showdown. And they, industrial terms, they seem to be able to restock and resupply their troops. So given this, how long can NATO continue is an issue, because they seem to have banked their, uh, that, that they will uh, be able to force Russia to its knees because of the financial sanctions. Mm -hmm. That not having worked, that can they continue now to indefinitely support a war like this is the question. So it's not clear to me what is the end game going to be. As you have said, there is a 300,000 soldiers mobilization that is the, that Russia is doing. And if they do this 300,000 soldiers, what will they do with it is, of course, the uh, question. Will they put it in Donbass and the two other oblasts and provinces and keep them there? Will they use it for further advances into Ukraine? Is it a war which is then going to be for the whole of Ukraine or at least up right. to the Dnieper River? These are all open questions. We don't know. Uh, all we know is that Russia has decided that it needs to mobilize further, that this 
special military operation they were doing, which actually used only about 10 to 15 percent of their armed strength, they need to significantly uh, enlarge that because from 150,000 to 300, another 300,000 is a huge increase. Right. So it's a, it is going to be three times what they have already put in place. So if that happens, then we don't really know because you, their objective was not land. While if you take Ukraine, Zelensky's objective was appearing to hold territory. Mm -hmm. Russian objective was more to destroy the Ukrainian army. Capacities. And that, uh, that is, if, if we take that as the objective, then Russia at the moment is not worried about how much land they have occupied or not occupied. The question is, what is NATO going to do? Because I don't think the Ukrainian government is any longer an independent player. Uh, they need even the NATO countries, European Union and the United States to fund their daily budget. So given that, it really depends on what NATO is uh, wanting to do. And at the moment, we do not see a change of opinion in NATO. Germany, the key player in European Union, or France, these are two major European Union players in NATO. They don't, they don't seem to be thinking about what is the likely outcome for them, themselves or their people. As we have seen, the United Kingdom, the other big player, uh, has been beating the war drum with about 80,000 troops, which is really much, much smaller than what Ukraine has put in the field. So given all of that, it's very difficult to say what is the objective that the European Union or That's NATO it. countries have in this. Is it only to bleed uh, Russia as long as they can? And uh, then they don't really care about what happens to Ukraine either. Or is it that they have an end game in plan, in play, which we have known nothing about and we'll all be surprised suddenly by something or the other? The problem that we have, the larger problem for the world, apart from the economic crisis which this has caused, is also both sides of nuclear weapons. Mm -hmm. And that is something that we need to take into account. What happens to European Union and what happens if it suddenly you know, becomes a more of a nuclear confrontation. Right. These are the two open questions we have. Thank you so much, Shabir. So there we have it, another sobering conclusion as we talk about what's happening in Ukraine, in Europe and the entire world. Europe also, a major election taking place this week, it has taken place this week in Italy with the far right all set to come to power. We'll be covering many of these issues in future episodes of Mapping Fault Lines. Until then, keep watching NewsClick.